Greetings, programs. My name is Wretch, and I'd like to welcome you to Steve Jackson's Starship Traveler, a fighting fantasy adventure game book. Um, those familiar with the channel will know that I've done two of these already. One was Steve Jackson's Appointment with Fear, and the other was Judge Dread Countdown Sector 106. And it looks like now we're going to get into some interstellar sci-fi, which I'm all happy about. This was given to me as a Steam gift by one of my longtime subscribers, Vosseros, so thank you very much, Vosseros. I will try not to blow up the ship and the universe at the same time. So let's go ahead and give this a play. Starship Traveler is a fighting fantasy game book, an interactive adventure in which you are the hero. In the adventure which follows, you are the captain of a starship, lost in an unknown universe. Your own skills as a captain will determine whether you and your crew will ever see Earth again. So it's kind of like Star, uh, Star Trek Voyager. You're about to be flung through a black hole into unknown space. Spoilers. Your only chance of return will be to find another suitable black hole and guide the ship through it back to your own universe. You must first choose your difficulty setting. This game book has been designed for optimum challenge on the classic difficulty mode. For newcomers to fighting fantasy, we recommend experiencing the game in free read mode. So, we are definitely not newcomers, so I guess we'll go ahead and play Classic. Play Starship Traveler as Steve Jackson designed it. Classic difficulty is a faithful recreation of the printed version. Your starting stamina is calculated by rolling 2d6 plus 12. You're also given unlimited bookmarks, which act like placing your fingers between the pages. So this, is, this plays more like Judge Dredd than Appointment with Fear. So let's do Classic. Oh, here we go. Having served as a dedicated officer of the Astro Navy for many years, your experience and skill has been rewarded with your promotion to captain. You wear your new uniform with pride as you enter your name on the registration console. So we get to name ourselves here, huh? Oh, I really have to resist the urge to name myself Zap Brannigan. Um, what do we... I know what we can call ourselves. Joel Robinson. And if you get that, if you understand that name and get that reference, good on you, because MST3K is awesome. And male gender? The registration console requests you finalize your new position with a statistical scan. Using advanced technology, the console will determine your base stamina, skill, and luck values. You place your palm flat on the registration console to complete the process. So, I do want Joel here to have decent stats, so I guess we'll use our first bookmark here. And now we have this spot saved. So let's see what our stamina is. Ew. Whoa. Did... Okay, we rolled, we rolled snake eyes, but I pressed the button again and it actually f shot the dice up in the air and it rolled an 8. Your roll of 8 plus a base of 12 means your stamina is 20. I'll, I'll take that. That's cool. Can we do that again? Okay, so there's only one dice for skill. Your roll of 5 plus a base of 6 means your skill is 11. I didn't want to re-roll there. How about luck? And a roll of 4 plus a base of 6 means your luck is 10. I'm going to go ahead and stick with these. I think these are pretty good. That was crazy. With the process complete, you remove your palm from the console. You adjust your uniform with pride and holster your standard issue phaser. Head to the Admiral's Quarters for briefing. You arrive at the Admiral's Quarters to receive your mission briefing. Admiral Jackson, nice, your superior, enters and you salute. He explains your mission, your main goal being to seek out new planets and explore uncharted sectors of the galaxy. As the Astro Navy's newest captain, you are to be assigned a starship. Admiral Jackson directs, to, directs you to choose from the following. We can take the Starship Traveler or choose our own starship. Well, due to the fact that the game is called Starship Traveler, I think we should go ahead and take that, so we will go ahead and take the main ship. You decide to take the Traveler and perform a routine diagnostics check. Oh, we have to roll for the ship stats, too. Strength and shields. So, let's roll. That's pretty good. Your roll of 5 plus a base of 6 means your weapon strength is 11. And what about the shields? 4? A roll of 4 plus a base of 12 means your shields is 16. I'll take that. With the diagnostics check complete, you and the Admiral are satisfied that the Traveler is in perfect working order. Follow Admiral Jackson to assemble your crew. Admiral Jackson offers you two choices when assembling the crew of the Starship Traveler. 
Get right to the action and take the Admiral's recommendation, or be more strategic and handpick your own crew. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I kind of want to get right to the action here, so I'm going to assume that the Traveler already has a crew that the Admiral has uh, already put on the ship, and we're just joining the party. Admiral Jackson assigns you as hand-picked crew, consisting of the most skilled members of the Astro Navy. Your team consists of a science officer, a medical officer, and an engineering officer. Each of these officers are skilled in their fields and can, offer, and can often offer you helpful advice. In addition, your medical officer is able to restore two stamina points to your crew members after returning from a mission. Oh, we have away teams. Protecting the crew is a security officer and their two security guards. Red shirts. They are your first choice for battle, as all other crew receive a minus three skill penalty during combat. Ew. Finally, Admiral Jackson hands you a tiny bundle of fur. It is a small white cat. Okay, I was about to say, if you handed me a tribble, so help me. The Admiral explains that one of the most important parts of this mission is to research the effects of interstellar travel on pets and their ability to withstand artificial gravity over long periods of time. Onward! With your brave crew of the Starship Traveler, you give Admiral Jackson a salute. The Admiral gives one final look at the ship's cat and says, Take good care of Scratchy. Godspeed, Captain Joel Robinson. Suddenly, bursting in and out of breath, a young man arrives. He apologizes profusely to the Admiral for his delay. Admiral Jackson informs you that this ensign is a son of an important senator and will be accompanying you on the mission. The ensign's name... Oh, we can name the ensign too? Uh... Well, I'll tell you what, if we have, uh... Joel Robinson is captain. The ensign's got to be Mike Nelson. You are now ready to set off. You take your seat on the bridge and prepare yourself for the adventure ahead. Dismissed. Eh, whoa. Panic. Well, that escalated quickly. From your seat at the helm of the Starship Traveler, you study the VDU anxiously. Engineering section has reported an overdrive malfunction which has locked up the warp engines at a 10% velocity gain. You're watching the velocity indicator advancing rapidly through the safe region towards overload. You hit the communicator button and call engineering for further news. It is not good. The malfunction cannot be traced and it will take another 13 minutes for a system check to provide a full analysis. You're heading towards the... Celsian Void, a known black hole. You may or may not avoid it, but science officer Zarg has another plan. If you swing the ship through its immense gravitational pull, its gravity drag may help reduce your speed as you travel away from it. It is worth a try, but the navigation tuning will have to be precise. I don't know about Zarg there. You swing the starship hard to starboard as you enter the Celsian's gravitational field and fasten your eyes on the velocity indicator. To your great relief, the plan seems to be working. The gain comes down from 10% to 5% to 0 to negative 5%. Loud cheers come from the crew, but you're still watching the velocity indicator. It is now showing negative 15%, then negative 25%, and still falling. The Traveler is being sucked into the Celestian Void, or the Celtian Void. You hit the red alert button and you instruct all ship's personnel to strap themselves down. It wasn't a red alert already? The ship begins to whine and shake as it rapidly accelerates towards the black hole. There's nothing you can do to avert the impending disaster. An almighty explosion rocks the ship. All the crew, including you, lose consciousness. You and the other members of the crew are regaining consciousness. Again, you hit the communicator and call for systems damage reports. All systems appear to be intact until engineering reports that the warp drive engines are dead. You are floating in space. But your drive reactor should be operational in 20 to 30 minutes. Your navigation officer is bewildered. He cannot identify your whereabouts and the computer reports you're in uncharted space. Science officer Zarg has run an event analysis and you appear to have gone through the black hole, through a dimension warp, and you are now in what seems to be a parallel universe. After some delay, you regain warp drive. Long-range scan indicates three solar systems ahead, of which two may have intelligent life. What are your orders, Captain? Ooh. Set so we have a choice between a life-bearing system ahead, a life-bearing system to port, and a barren system on the starboard side. Let's go ahead and put in a bookmark. And... Well, we have life-bearing systems over here. Let's go ahead and try the the one that doesn't seem obvious. Let's go for the Baron system on the starboard. You increase speed towards your destination. Suddenly a red light appears on your control panel. 
You hit your communicator switch and contact the engineering section. We'll have to cut, cut speed, Captain, cries engineering officer Faust. The reactor must have been damaged more than I thought. I can't hold her. You ask what exactly the problem is and learn that your supplies of Delibrium Crystal are almost exhausted. Delibrium qu Crystal is a naturally occurring mineral common throughout your own galaxy. The raw material can be mined and travelers equipped with a processing plant to convert it to nuclear fuel. You must begin searching for the mineral straight away, for without Delibrium, your ship will be unable to travel. Continue traveling towards the Bering system. Investigate a small, or nearby small asteroid cluster. Well, maybe the asteroid cluster has something that we can use. Sensors scan the asteroid cluster. In the center of the cluster is an asteroid containing some delibrium, but it's impossible at this range to ascertain exactly which asteroid has the mineral. You may investigate by sending out one of your officers with a jetpack, but the going will be dangerous. The center of the cluster is a mass of whirling asteroids, each one big enough to kill a person. Risk sending out one of your crew, decide against the risk, and head onwards. Well, we need Delibrium, but I don't want to risk one of the crew. Let's see if we can find this. I don't know if we can go back, but let's go ahead and decide against the risk and head onwards. You are now faced with a problem. You may continue at warp speed and hope your supply of Delibrium lasts until you reach your destination, or you may hook in an auxiliary power source, which will drain energy from one of your other functions. Your order, Captain? Yeah, warp speed. Why not? You order the Traveler to continue ahead at warp speed. Time to test our luck. You must roll equal or lower than your luck of 10 to succeed. So... You are lucky. Ooh, and how. Engineering Officer Faust protests loudly, but you order them to continue at your present speed. The warning indicator begins to flash as it enters overload. Continue at warp... I guess we can keep... Continue. The ship begins to shudder, but your scanners indicate you are not far from your destination, the small blue-green planet ahead. To your great relief of your crew, you order engineering to cut warp engines and slow down to sublight speed in order to approach the planet. You approach a small blue-green planet and take up an orbital position. You scan the planet for signs of life. It appears to be lifeless, but the scanners are giving some strange readings which you cannot understand. You try an all-frequency radio message, but receive no answer. Suddenly, the scanners pick up a signal, probably a ship of some kind, traveling towards you extremely fast in orbit from the other side of the planet. You can switch to visual, and you can see two missile-shaped objects hurtling towards you. You hit the red alert button and activate shields, waiting to see what happens. From nowhere, a blast hits the ship. Four more missiles are fast approaching the Traveler. In this battle, the missiles get the first attack. Each missile is destroyed, whether it hits, misses, or is shot down. Protect the ship from the missiles to survive this battle. Holy crap, we're getting into our first uh, fight. Well, let's engage. Ooh. Weapons. Shields. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here. Um, I guess we'll roll. Incoming missile has travelers in its sights. Ow. Oh, it missed. Cool. I guess it has to roll less, then. So now we fire. And I see. Okay, we have to roll less than that. That's cool. And we've got incoming. Oh, final shot decimates your opponent. That's not good. But we did survive the missile attack. Your crew managed to skillfully destroy the missiles, protecting the Traveler from attack. What are your orders, Captain? Well, first off, let's get the battle stations. Because we did get attacked. Another blast narrowly misses the ship and you decide to retaliate. Engage. Well, this is bad. But I guess we don't have a choice in the matter. We got attacked first. And... We hit. I like that little dice trick. That's actually going to help us, I think. Incoming. Roll high. Nope. It was going to hit us. It still hit. Oh, well. Now, let's go ahead and... Return fire. 
There we go. We're doing a lot better than the sh alien ship is. And... Oh, it hit us again. Let's fire back. It should They should be done for here. Ooh. This is a tough little ship. There we are. That's what we needed. Now we should be able to... Hull breach. Gotcha. Final shot decimate your opponent. And we defeated the Star Cruiser. Resuming orbital position, you scan the planet ahead. Although readings are still puzzling, you cannot find positive signs of life. Suddenly, Engineer Officer Faust contacts you, their voice filled with urgency. Captain Joel Robinson, it is imperative that we find Delibrium Crystals for the Traveler's engines. We must explore the planet. With no other choice, you prepare to search for a precious Delibrium Crystal. Time to send it away, team, I guess. Nice. Um, how many can we bring? Let's get our science officer. Yes, make it so. Science officer Zarg. Medical officer Muscles. Really? Um, I don't think, well, no, we always, we always brought Spock and Bones along on away teams, didn't we? Or at least Kirk did. Ooh. And it looks like we could only take that many. That's not good. When you have made your selection, continue to the planet. Prepare to leave. Scanning the planet, you are relieved to find an area of Delibrium ore deposits. You and your two crew members prepare to beam down to the mineral-rich area. Seconds before you do, the ship's ensign, Mike Nelson, appears. Hi, Mike. Despite your insistence that he stay on the ship, he beams down, and you head after him to make sure he causes no trouble. Oh, Mike. The planet is barren and rocky. A howling wind blasts across the planet's surface. Using a portable scanner, you locate a deposit of crystal ore and instruct one of your crew members to collect several kilos with their micro-excavator. Before returning to the ship, you decide to investigate the planet a little more, starting with a ravine several hundred meters ahead. As you descend into the ravine, you use your portable scanner to probe the land. Behind you, you hear S. Ensign Mike Nelson complaining of thirst. You tell Mike Nelson to toughen up and fall back in line. Looking downwards, you can see what appears to be a stream running along the valley and you climb down to investigate. Your scanner indicates that it is water, but gives a strange reading. Ensign Mike Nelson continues to complain about the heat, then bends down to take a drink of the water. You order him to stay away, but he has already taken a sip and tells you, Oh, Mike, not to worry, as the stream really is water. On the bank of a river is a natural-looking deposit of a yellow-colored powder which your scanner cannot analyze. Other than this, the planet seems to be totally barren. Um, let's take some of the yellow powder to the ship for further analysis. I want to find what exactly the ensign consumed. One of your crew members takes a sample of the yellow mineral powder and stores it for analysis when you return to the ship. I guess we can continue exploring the planet then. We are explorers after all. Continuing along the ravine, you find only rocky ground. Your portable scanner indicates nothing unusual beneath the surface. Climbing up the slopes, you are again hit by the rushing wind, blowing up a dust storm. We'll beam up. You and the crew beam up to the Traveler. You immediately head for the bridge. As you make your way back to the bridge, Engineering Officer Faust bleeps you on your communicator. They are pleased to inform you that the ore that you have found has been successfully converted into fuel for the reactor. You enter your report in the computer and use long-range scanners to probe for your next destination. Scanners indicate two likely stars ahead with planetary systems in orbit, one a bright purple star and the other a double star. Medical officer muscles tends to the wounded on board the ship, two stamina are restored to any injured crew members. So we can choose the bright purple star or the double star. Let's put in a bookmark. Let's go ahead and try... Let's go for the bright purple star, why not? You plot a course and leave orbit, entering warp speed towards the purple planet. A message comes up through the intercom of a disturbance in the ship's canteen and you have asked to attend straight away. Oh, this is probably Nelson again. Oh, there he is. As you reach the canteen, excited crew members rush towards you. Although they are all talking at once, you get the general gist of what has happened. One of the crew seems to have gone mad. He's been throwing trays of food around the canteen and fighting with the other staff. 
You open the door and find him being held in a corner by three of the security crew. Not an easy task. You recognize the troublemaker and guess what has probably happened. It's Ensign Mike Nelson, who took a drink on the barren planet you have just left. He is now a raging madman, straining against his captors, a heavy sweat on his red face and neck. Seeing you, he calms down. Will... We have him released and try to talk to him, call for a sedative drug from the medical station, or ask for a report on the planet for the samples you brought back. Let's go with that first and foremost. An analysis of the data available on the deserted planet is run, but no indication is given the cause of the madness. The yellow powder seems to be an organic powder unlike anything known to your chemical analysts. Hmm. Well, order the crew member to be administered the yellow powder. Um... No. Let's request a medical team first. The medical team arrives and prepares to administer a sedative. As they approach Ensign Mike Nelson, he lashes out and becomes violent. You must react quickly before this escalates. What do you do, Captain? Um... Command the first security guard to subdue the prisoner. Command the second security guard to subdue the prisoner. Or step aside, I'll subdue the prisoner myself. Due to the fact that he calmed down when I walked in, I think that would be the best thing. I'm gonna take a hands-on approach as Captain. You grab Ensign Mike Nelson, who immediately lashes out and attempts to strike you. You attempt to dodge the sudden outburst. Roll two dice. You must roll equal or lower than your skill of 11 to succeed. Oh, already? That would do it. You definitely passed the skill check. You manage to secure Mike Nelson long enough for the medical team to administer the drug. Your enraged captive slumps to the floor, unconscious. Head to the medical section. The now un unconscious Ensign Mike Nelson is taken to the medical section where Medical Officer Muscle runs tests. Now, roll two dice, you must roll equal or lower than Muscle's medical skill of 11 to succeed. I'm kind of glad that we went with the base crew. Awesome. After running several tests, Medical Officer Muscles discovers a strange microorganism in Ensign Mike Nelson's bloodstream. Trying various antibiotics, they finally come up with an effective one and administer what they hope will be the cure. Sometime later, Mike Nelson wakes up with a terrible headache, but cured of his madness. You chide Nelson for his ineptitude and hope that this will be the last of his antics. I highly doubt that. <laughs> Let's continue on the journey. You reset your onwards course. We head for the purple star ahead, or the double star. Well, now that we got the situation with Nelson dealt with, let's bookmark. And let's keep heading toward the purple star. Why not? Approaching the purple star, your scanners indicate that the second planet has an atmosphere ideal for life. You drop into orbit around this planet and scan the surface. There are strong indi indications of intelligent activity. Indeed, it's likely that the planet's civilization is further advanced than your own. What are your orders, Captain? Let's beam down. I see no prime directive here. Assemble your crew for the second planet with strong indications of intelligent activity. So let's bring Zarg as our science officer and let's get oh, security officer Drake. Let's do that. Yeah, a little bit of muscle to go along with the brains. And we'll beam down. Ooh. Okay. Now, Kirk, or not Kirk, but this would not be someone that Kirk would want to have relations with. You try an all-frequency broadcast several times, but receive no messages in reply. You and your crew enter the transmatter unit and beam down to the surface. You materialize in a deserted street. Tall buildings on one side tower over you, while on the other side of the street the buildings are small. Perhaps these are private dwellings. The architecture is alien, but no life of any kind can be seen. In the distance, ahead of you down the road, you can hear a whirring sound. Soon you can see a strange vehicle which seems to be heading towards you. It is a hover car of some kind and it's moving slowly. As you decide what to do, your translator picks up the sound. Over here! Quick! You look around and see a human-sized, somewhat insect-shaped creature beckoning you into one of the small buildings. Um, okay, we'll go with that. We'll follow the mantis guy. You run off the road and follow him into the building. Just in time, he exclaims. You don't want the PCs to find you in the street, do you? You have no idea what he is talking about. You explain you are not from this planet. He's on his guard. You reassure him that you mean no harm. You just want information which may help you get home. And he calms down. You are on the planet Kulematter, he informs you. 
The PCs you have just escaped are from pop are the population controllers. On this planet, no one dies, but as the population increases, it is necessary to exterminate some of us to make room for others. The PCs have the authority to exterminate anyone they like within certain quota limits, without reason. It's kind of a more extreme Logan's run. They would certainly have killed you had they caught you outside after curfew hours. Suddenly, the door crashes open and three creatures in armored uniforms step in. I thought I saw them enter this building, their leader declares. Outside, he orders. Your host protests that you are aliens and did not know about the curfew laws, but the PC leader points a finger and an electric blue ray burns through his chest. He decided it would be prudent to obey the PC's orders. Oh, they killed our buddy. You explain that you are from another planet and therefore know nothing of their curfew laws. It is illegal to be outside after curfew, says their leader. The penalty is extermination. Enter this vehicle. What now, Captain? Obey the aliens and enter the vehicle. Draw your phasers and fire. I say we draw the phasers and fire, because that's just... no. Roll one die. If you roll a one, two, three, four, or five. If you rolled a six... Ooh. We rolled a six. The blast hits the leader and has no effect whatsoever. Perhaps their armor is blast resistant or perhaps they're just invulnerable to phaser fire. Turning towards you, the leader points his finger and an electric blue ray shoots from the tip right through your body, killing you instantly. Wow. Okay, well then. Let's go ahead and get back to uh, where we were. Maybe the purple star is not good for us, but... We may go ahead and continue and see if we can find something else to do on that planet or head for the double star. I'm not sure. But we will go ahead and end the episode here, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm very much liking this. I like the music. I like I like the vibe that this um, adventure book is giving off. But if you like the video, go ahead and click like down below. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. That'd be a big help. And we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.